Welcome to season one, episode three of A Story Club Global Cultures. This is a unique venture streaming simultaneously from Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean, where I'm located, Dehradun in India, and San Francisco in the United States, where my producer and co-producers are located. On, glo on Global Cultures, we speak with people around the world, trying to understand different cultures, their uniqueness, their problems and issues, and how we can all learn and work together while remaining grounded in our distinctive cultural matrices. Today, my guests are Professor Selwyn Kudjo and writer Kevin Baldeo Singh. Welcome. Hey, man. Thank you. Good to Thank be you. on. All right. I, let me just set up the topic for, for the listeners, and then we'll enter into the discussion. Uh, our topic today is 100 years of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago is, in fact, um, the country that, uh, as I said, I'm based in. My family's been here for six generations. It's, this, uh, this island, this state, is a product of an exceptionally global history, and it's also made unique contributions to the world. You know? What can the world learn from a small Caribbean twin island state like Trinidad and Tobago? Trinidad and Tobago has given the world a large number of leading personalities, intellectuals, political activists, entertainers, athletes, uh, you know, especially for its size. These include Nobel laureate V.S. Naipaul, Pan-Africanist Kwame Ture or Sophie Carmichael, uh, and Henry Sylvester Williams, political sage C.L.R. James, rapper Nicki Minaj, historian and statesman Eric Williams, dancer and actor Jeffrey Holder, cricketer Brian Lara, footballer Dwight York, singer Billy Ocean, Islamic eschatologist Sheikh Imran Hussein, Chinese nationalist revolutionary Eugene Chen, all from a tiny island of 1.3 million people. Its fascinating history tells the story of colonialism, of decolonization and independence, of the challenges and promises of cultural diversity, the process of blending East and West in the new world, challenges of economic development for small and formerly colonial countries. So today I am joined by two writers and thinkers who have been uh, speaking about Trinidad and Tobago to Trinidadians and to global audiences uh, for decades now. And it is a real pleasure to have them here. Uh, welcome, Kevin, and welcome again, Selwyn. Again, nice to be here yeah. with you and Kevin. Now, uh, I'd like to start off with you all just informing our audience uh, just a little bit more about who you are, what you do, you know, and, and especially as it relates to the topic of Trinidad and Tobago, but, but wider as well. Um, let me start off with Professor Kajo and then Kevin afterward. Well, I, I wasn't sure what we were going to get into, mm -hmm. uh, but I think your introduction uh, gives me a sense of where you're going and what you want to achieve. Uh, you started off by saying, uh, about, certainly about the mixtures of cultures and peoples. I mean, if you read a book, I think Trinidad written about it, 1865. I mean, the amount of cultures and peoples, and I mean, it was, it has always been a whole melange of peoples and languages and cultures and so on. Uh, you said that you are their sex generations. I'm from Tagarigo. And my uh, great, great grandfather is from Tagarigo. In point of fact, uh, he was born in, one was born or my great grand great grandmother was born in 1833 and my grandfather i think is 1830 we i have and funny now i have his book little book in which he kept his little stuff so it goes wow. back a long time and coming from tagarigua where you, you mentioned uh cla james and george padmore and henry sylvester williams and so on mm -hmm. uh the one who played the piano what's in it when he when he fred atwell and all those guys yeah. coming from tagarigua is a very interesting place because it has been one of the oldest. There were four encomiendas, as you remember, that the, the Amerindians were placed in, and was in San Juan, Juan Ari, but we, Tagrigo was one of the encomiendas. Mm -hmm. So we sort of go back a very really long time. Yeah. And um, so when I look at that history and I talk with people like James and so on, we're very fortunate 
The other thing, a little tidbit, uh, is that when the uh, Fetal Rosac came in, about, I guess, about 11, uh, 11 or the, uh, the immigrants went to Tagarigua. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, but the fact is, by 10 years later, Tagarigua has probably one of the largest population, El Dorado, Paradise, et cetera, et cetera. So mm -hmm. we ourselves have been an amalgam of all of those cultures. Mm -hmm. On the right. other side, my great, my grandmother, my great grandmother is Portuguese. Married mm -hmm. a Bajan. <laughs> right. You know, all the Bajans came to Trinidad yeah. uh, during the sugar, or they had the technology, the sugar technology, and we've been a young sugar colony. So I come from a great big melange of people, whole lots of cross culturals, having our Shango, or Jose, et cetera, going on Tagore River, throwing over the whatever, whatever. So in this sense, we are very, very multicultural. A group of people and I come, I represent, I think that I try my best to do that. The one thing I must say, Mr. Kelvin Balusing, is that I made a mistake last week, uh, this weekend and support, I said, go support UNC. I never see so much of nastiness. <laughs> <Never>. <laughs> <See>. <laughs> if I were willing to say that we had this lovely culture, the amount of people who cuss me and my mother and my auntie and my grandmother, <laughs> I really brought a whole other level, a whole other level of, um, Venom, which I didn't yes, know yes. exist, I must confess. So that's me just uh, playing on, uh, taking off on where Kurt left off yeah, in yeah. intense news. And, and just also, you know, for our listeners to know, you, you have been a professor at Wellesley College in oh, the United I have, States. Oh, I have my background. I have been, I, uh, I got my uh, first degrees from Fordham. Then I got my PhD from Cornell. Then I taught at Ohio University. Then I taught at Harvard, I've written the New York Times. I've written for the Bo the Boston Globe. I've been a call. I mean, I've just done a whole lot of stuff. Yeah, and mm -hmm. so on. so that's my background. So I try yeah. to you know do everything. Yeah, and Kevin, your, yourself. Um, and in 2011, I published well, before that, 2010, I published a novel called "The Ten Incarnations of Adam Avatar," which is a 500-year story about the Caribbean, and while I was exploring a particular theme of identity, what the book reveals is that the Caribbean is really a, a, a representative, a microcosm, if you will, of Western civilization's history, good and bad. Yeah. And so the Caribbean in general, when you know that history, you know Western history. And Trinidad in particular, after the, after the, um, from the 19th century onwards, well, you know, basically, again, if you know Trinidad's history, you understand a lot about Western civilization and Western history and how it developed. And that is part of the theme I deal with in the history book, the history of Trinidad book that um, we'll be touching on today. Right. So in that sense, we have the history of colonialism mm -hmm. um, from, from the 19th century onwards. And then we also have basically a case study of what happens to a society after colonialism. And Trinidad is a very good um, case study to use for that kind of analysis. Right, right. And, and just again for our listeners, because remember some of them are in the States, some of them are in India, and, and, and they might not be familiar with, with Trinidad and Tobago at all. Um, and you yourself, I mean, you're a published author, a novelist, um, you know, a fiction, and you also do nonfiction now. Um, yeah, I mean, your first novels were published in the 90s, were they? Oh, yeah. Uh, is he frozen? Yeah. Okay, it's good now. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, your first mm -hmm. novels, were, was it the autobiography of Paris P? That was your first novel? Yeah, the uh, Icarusque satirical novel, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. That's cool. and a newspaper columnist, of course, locally. But yeah, but you've been published internationally, Macmillan and so forth. And, and you also write for international publications, including yeah, Spike and other. Yeah, Spike and um, My, Mises Institute, right. Foundation for Economic Education and so on. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So, so good. Now, so as, as both of you are, are Trinidadians who have been speaking to the world, um, sometimes directly about Trinidad, sometimes not about Trinidadian things. Um, and as CLR James um, 
I said, what do they know of Trinidad who only Trinidad know? Um, uh, you, know you know where that came from? Yes, Kipling. No, I think I'm yeah. Kipling was taking one the Warner's book on cricket. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which, what uh, do they know of England who only England know? James yeah. took it from, but go ahead, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, that, I, uh, what do you think the world should be, well, do you think the world should be interested in Trinidad and Tobago at all? First of all, we're, we're just a small island of 1.3 million people. Why should anybody really be interested in us? Um, yeah, let, let me just throw that question out to you first. I'll start with Selwyn and then go to Kevin. Well, I think that, I mean, we're very young, <laughs> a very, very young place. Uh, but I think by certainly, certainly by fortune, mere sheer accident, we've had to uh, inculcate in bringing a lot of groups into one society. And I think the question of, um, I wouldn't say tolerance, the way in which we have come together and been able to share cultures, I think is an important thing that uh, sometimes we do it without even knowing it. When I grew up, for example, as I said, I live in an Indian village. I went to Indian weddings, uh, eating my little thing on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, the, the Bihari leaf. On the Bihari leaf, where the weddings were already open up. I knew about uh, something like I said, uh, Hussein Hassan, which is, of course, is a uh, Islamic uh, mm -hmm. Shiite sort of play and so on and so forth. I knew of Shango because my grandmother came from Ashango and had an African background. I always said we've had to make a historic compromise, my grand, my people, with Christianity, because they were, they were not Christians when they got here. They were either Yoruba or, or, or whatever. And of course, to fit into the society, we had to become Christians. There's a neighbor I had, his name was Trabali, Mr. Trabali. And I did a thing, I did a documentary on Tagore, it was about 1985. And he'd always tell me that, in fact, his name was really Tarub Ali. And when they had to go, his brother had to go to Kuasi, he had to change his name and call him Traboli. And of course, he had to make that compromise too. But in his last days, he began to speak his own language. And so that they have this tremendous, tremendous kind of thing. So I think what they should know about us is that we've been able in a small space to try to accommodate all of us. And even though there have been conflicts, I don't think anyone could be said that one has been uh, killed or murdered because of one's race, but they're, they're, they're always the, the lingering notions in any such community where you would have these antagonisms. But I think we've done a great job and you mentioned all those names like Eugene Chen and Padmore and all of those guys. There's something about a, an indomitable type of spirit. We could take on the world. I remember many years ago, there's a guy, an Indian guy who was a rider and had, done it, had gone in to ride for the, um, that big thing they have in the um, moment, Cassius Clay was born, where's that? Uh, the big Kentucky Derby. Right. And the boys say, listen, I'm going to show them. I'm going to finish with them. They're dead. <laughs> they say, <laughs> they is Trini. I mean, it's a kind of, like, and we bold face. Yeah. There's a bold faceness about it. When I asked James Riley why he wrote World Revolution, he got to England in 32, he says, and he wrote this book in 36. I said, why did you write it? He said, because there was nobody else there to do it. I said, oh my God, that is yeah. Trini. That is Trini. There's a bold faceness. I, think so then, I, I, I just want to share, sorry to interject, the exact, almost the exact same story, but in a different context. There was a, a, a Chinese Trinidadian friend of mine. She's actually Mauritian, Chinese Mauritian, and she moved here. And she was talking about this Trini attitude because we're so similar, Trinidad and Mauritius, but there's something that's different about Trinidad. She mm -hmm. said her Chinese friend, they went to some Chinese exhibition and looking at potteries and stuff, thousands of years old. And, there, and, and the, the, the curator, the people are talking about all the tradition and the intricacy and the patterns and stuff. And the Trini kind of goes, I, you know what, just give me a couple of months and I'm sure I could beat them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bold fierceness about them, which I think. The other thing too, and I think would be more applicable, I think, to Haiti, but the whole question of what James makes about the plantation economy and the sort of some of the very first proletariats because we had to work so closely together, which sort of gave us a head start in terms of being modern, the question mm -hmm. of modernity. 
So a guy, guy like Kevin could be in charge of the humanistic society and knows much about uh, humanism and, the, uh, and epistemology and so on. Because of bravery about us, we're not afraid to be wrong. So I think mm -hmm. that's one of the things that we should know about ourselves, which explains uh, people like Brian Lara and all of those guys who go yeah. out and take their place in the world. They're not. I mean, to, to a guy like Jack Warner, mm -hmm. even I like Jack, but Jack became the vice president, the one of the most. Him. I mean, how do we do it? And I think it's that sense of that sense of fearlessness and beliefs in ourselves, which we never had. There was one last thing that's gone. It's like when you did. I mean, I'm older than two of you guys, so I know it. When we did say GCs, or you did college, and you fail, you didn't fail because the engineer black, you just fail. Yeah. So you go and take it again. There was no sort of, we had no, there was no kind of excuses because of color and here and so on. It wasn't good enough. You go ahead and do it and so on. So I think that, I think that bold faceness and that sense of that early organi or political and economic organization, I think gave us a sort of, sort of head start in terms of modernity in terms of the new world, sorry. Right, uh, Kevin, uh, you know, why your answer on should the world be interested in us at all? And if so, why or why not? Oh, I think he's frozen up again. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, let's, oh. just take, let's just take, go ahead. <laughs> Let's take a little further. Is, it's like uh, a guy like Will. You on? I is just talked when he comes in. I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, kind <laughs> of. You're breaking up. Okay. I think you're back in now. Okay. Try again. Right. How how is this? Yeah. Is better. it okay? Yeah. Okay. Great. So what I say, Trinidad is a natural experiment, um, in the sense of here we have all of these different groups from different ancestral backgrounds in the same environment and we see different outcomes. So only from a social psychology perspective, you can do a lot of uh, investigations, a lot of data analysis to say, okay, why is this? And that would be useful for the world in terms of other things, in terms of policy measures, and how do you arrange your politics, how do you arrange your economy, and so on. Um, I am perhaps a bit more cynical than, than Selwyn <laughs> in the sense that Yes, we have gotten along well as different groups, but one question that occurred to me early is, how come in Trinidad, our racial relations are so much better than Guyana's, where you basically have the same makeup? And my hypothesis, which you know I'm just throwing out there, is that it's a function of size. We were thrown together closely. Guyana is big. The groups could have remained separate. So there was never that need for interaction that, as Selwyn correctly pointed out, happened in Trinidad. So I think a lot of external factors and some good luck came together to create what we have here, which is, as you know, apart from the politics, it is basically a harmonious society in terms of, in, in terms of race. Uh, there's no serious racial animosity and the politics actually works almost in contravention to the normal social relations. So all those, this is why the world, to answer your question, it is useful for the world to pay attention to a society like ours because it answers many questions that have been with us for a long time and which are rising up again with the whole identity politics and you know, yeah. all these kind of things. Now. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to add my my answer to, to yours, uh, both both uh, Selwyn and yours too. Um, and I want to go back to James, CLR James, who I think is the sort of grandfather of every single other intellectual in our society. Such a such a great, great, great in, inspiring person and man and recognized throughout the world. Um, but he, he's always talked about the Caribbean, the West Indies, as the birthplace of modernity itself, right? This is where Columbus came, where the sort of vast plantations, you know, before industrialization, the internationalization of, of finance, of trade, import, export economy. So you, you have all that. And we always understood the dark side of modernity, right? The dark side of the Enlightenment. So that's why, and, and so we've produced an extraordinary 
number of thinkers and writers and artists from, you know, if we take the Caribbean, you could say like Marcus Garvey and whatnot, but if you take uh, Trinidad, then, you know, James and Naipaul and Eric Williams and, and these people. And, and, um, and as, as Kevin talked about, um, the uh, understanding our history really makes you understand aspects of Western culture itself, which is at the heart, not at the margin, but uh, that is often ignored by Western society. And, and we see, and at independence, uh, we, we used to like to talk about ourselves as a model nation, a model, uh, yeah, model, a, a model UN, right? Uh, and and we, we have these um, uh, extraordinary stories of, 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 of people trying to live together, uh, and I suppose development issues of, of size and whatnot. And, um, and then also the legacy of colonialism and uh, what the, these things are very important and, and the way we have have dealt with them. And I just think our people are fascinating. <laughs> just the stories we have are fascinating. So I just wanted to add that in to, um, uh, to the things you have done, because I mean, you, you have illustrated all these things I've talked about in your own work. I, I don't think it's anything new. I'm just articulating it here. That's all. But um, I, I, you know, to, to elaborate uh, on this, um, my next question I wanted us to, to talk about was, um, uh, and I think you've you've kind of answered it already in terms of, you know, the lessons that our national story has had for the rest of the world. Um, but since you've kind of answered that, let's fold that into the next to the next topic I suppose we could talk about, which is how you see Trinidad's history. If, if we take say the last hundred years and that's, um, and for our listeners who, who don't know, it was a Spanish colony then taken over by the British. But in between that, there was a period of French settlement that was very important. Um, uh, and then uh, African slavery was, was important throughout, throughout that period. Although it was a, we weren't a large plantation society like Jamaica or, or, or Antigua. Tobago was, but not Trinidad. Um, and then we had Indian indenture from 1845, uh, which were my ancestors and Kevin's mainly came from, I don't know if Kevin has other mixture as well. Um, but uh, and so, so we have these mixtures, we have Syrians, we have Chinese, we have Portuguese. Um, and then uh, we, we, we have all, the, all these mixtures here. And there is a story, there's an interesting story, I believe. Um, I don't know if Kevin believes in these sort of teleological things. I, I, I think the Hegelian uh, kind of background that Selwyn come, comes from, uh, maybe uh, he may have, have more of a story like that. But, but would you say, is it fair to summarize your view, Kevin, as maybe a story of decline because from 1920 if we take 100 years that's when the indentureship system ended and that was very important to the global indian nationalist movement by the way but so that's when it ended there and so do you kevin do you see the story as one of decline and selwyn would it be fair to your to interpret your sort of historiography of trinidad as a kind of what i would call a dialectical process of uneven, of uneven development and progress. So in other words, I, I want to understand how you guys see the development of Trinidad over, you know, over time, we can concentrate on the last hundred years. We'll start with you, Selwyn, because I think Kevin is having some problems. No, I am. Um, I, the point that Kevin makes, I mean, history is all about accidents. Yeah. <laughs> the fact that we were closer together. I mean, Guyana has a very large land mass. People live just on the close to the shore and there's a whole big hinterland and nobody lives there apart from the... So those are contributing factors. Uh, there's not a sort of counter argument there. In terms, I don't know what we mean by decline. I, I don't think yeah. we have been declining. I, I mean, you go, I mean, I'm thinking, I'm sure Hegel is great about this in terms of the dialectical intradation of forces and, and, and things. Things happen. And you know, we do our things, and again, I guess where Marx comes in, that is almost a blind way. We do what we must do in response to certain kinds of conditions and certain things happen and, and, and so on. So I don't know that we've been declining. I think that we've been growing up. 
uh, you made a very important point about what's happening now in terms of Indian nationalism uh, throughout the world and what we can do and what we can say. One of the points I've been making, I mean, of course, we knew Suriname, we knew Guyana had a larger Indian population. Now, same thing is true for that. And what I did with the last census about two years ago, I got two statisticians, one from um, university in um, New Jersey and a colleague here to go ahead and tell us, uh, extrapolate from those census data, what are the likely outcomes in terms of different proportions. And we know that say by 1830 or 19, sorry, 2030, that the largest population is gonna be the Indians. And they're gonna be about probably 44%, blacks will remain the same and so on. And that may have some implications for our relations. But I think that we have sort of responded and everybody, you know, sort of thing, everybody has played their part. I mean, if you look at that history, you, talk, you got to talk about Albert Gomes. Mm -hmm. You course. got to talk about Butler. You got to talk about Ajuda Singh. I mean, there's all of these different- Cipriani. Forces. You got to talk about Badi Sagan Maharaja mm -hmm. uh, and so on. So our thing is, I, I, I don't think it's a decline as I think it's been an opening up. What is new now, apart from the when you talk about Indian nationalism, is the whole role. We're talking right here with, I'm, I'm, entering, I, I'm, I'm here in, in Boston, you in Trinidad, the young lady is in San Francisco. And with those forces impacted upon the world, the nature of our cognition, which is the big thing, how we know to cognize or to know how we interpret the world will be, is gonna be quite different. And even the kinds of forces that sort of, prevented us from reaching out at uh, their own doorstep. So we could sit here and see what happens, what's happening in the United States in terms of elections and how Bush or Trump is behaving. We could look and see, I mean, that whole blast yesterday. So those new forces would make us into, not a, it, 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 it would take us away from our short, our enclaves. When I grew up, we just knew Tagarigua. There was, yeah. so I think I wouldn't see decline, I see, or rising up or broadening of our horizons. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I wanted to, um, to elaborate on, on some of the things you, you said just there. Like for instance, um, you know, in, in the 1950s, if you, if you read a lot of the anthropology and a lot of the soci sociologists, Americans were very interested in us, probably because their bases were here. So you had that research going on. But um, uh, so they used to always talk about Trinidad as a cosmopolitan place. Yeah, and we sort of have, have... Because as a student that won a thesis for me, and there's a big thing between Harry Belafonte and yep. uh, Wesley, because at that sense, we were the center, not reggae, Calypso yeah, yeah, yeah. at the center. Yeah, Belafonte's Calypso was the number one record in the United States oh, in oh, 1956. So that in that sense... Yeah, and yeah. also this guy coming and do this. Who did it? The, the Trinidad Village. What's his name? Uh, the Herskovitz. Huh? Herskovitz. Herskovitz. And so, as a form of, um, yeah, yeah. you know, so we were important in that sense. Yeah. So, but but we had we've had this cosmopolitan. So even someone like you, you said you were just confined in your village in Tagarigua, right? But what was your village? Your village was Hindus, Muslims, oh, yeah. Shiite festivals, Yoruba, you know, see, so you had all these things so that even if, if you were transplanted somewhere into London or New York, you had more of a global knowledge about these things that, that That's a true. lot of that, people- yes. That's been a know, parochial, that yeah, sense. And, 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 and we, we've, you know, we were naturally just interacting with these things for, for generations, you know. And it's very interesting, you, you mentioned that 1863 book or 1865? 1865, Trinidad, yes. Right, right. Fantastic. Which one? Charles... Um, uh, no, it's just Trinidad. It's Trinidad by, I forget the order, I could check it. I, I, I think I know it. I, I think I might have it's a copy of it. Trinidad, and it talks yeah. about all of the varied cultures and the languages, and, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, it goes even By before, the way, it's about 17 languages being spoken at the time. Huh? That's right. Even mm -hmm. up to 1950, we used to have uh, French translators, Hindi translators, Tamil yes. translators. Tamil, in the yes, court. because you had a madrasi. That's right, in the court. <laughs> it, it was in the blue book, the colonial blue book, you, you'd yeah. see these things. But um, uh, so you talk about the diversity in 1865, but even before Columbus came, there were roughly 14 different um, Amer 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 peoples okay. and, and each of them, because we're so diverse in terms of okay. flora, 
fauna, okay. ecological zones, the mountainous areas, the beach areas, the savanna areas, the tropical rainforest area in this tiny space. I honestly think I, this may get a little bit too out there, but I think there's something metaphysically different about here than Guyana. That uh, the size is part of it, but but it's always and if we disappear and new people come in, I think that that diversity is always going to be part of there. But now, Kevin, um, yes. you're back. I'm glad to. I, I know there was a little problem. So yeah. So. Um, you know, I, I was trying to characterize uh, perhaps both of your visions of, you know, the development of Trinidad and Tobago uh, and any sort of meaning. And I was maybe saying with your From Colony to Curse, your most recent book from <laughs> 1901 to 2001, w w how would you describe it? I don't know if you know Nirad Chowdhury and, and his look at, uh, it, it almost reminds me of a Nirad Chowdhury kind of look, almost like San a story of decline in some sense. Is, is that right or no? Um, decline is perhaps too broad brush a term. Yeah. So, but there is a definite break in the middle of the century, 1950 exactly. Um, so what we have in the first, <coughs> first half of the 20th century is of course the colonial rule. And what I found when I was writing the book, going into the sources mainly the newspapers and statistical records was that our narrative, of course, the colonial narrative is one of oppression. Yeah. And when I look back, I find that at the very least, that narrative is exaggerated. That the colonial authorities were running a particular unit of the British Empire, but they saw it as part of the British Empire. So you're, you're, not necessarily going to oppress what is part of your identity. So that's one thing that comes out in these statistics. <laughs> yeah, so then we come to 1950, and then there's a sea change that just happened because of trade unionism in the 1930s, because of the Second World War, and now there's a new perspective on the mother country, Britain, there's a new perspective on white people and all that plays into why the movement for self-rule and for local authority, local government are accelerated by 1950, leading of course to the PNM. Now, what is interesting about that is that, again, the narrative says that a lot of oppression, a lot of economic woes, and so on, are what led to the um, PNM at itself rule to independence. Again, what I found, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, mm -hmm. what I found was that the statistics and <coughs> other evidence didn't support that. In other words, the economy wasn't the main driving factor and not even in a sense was ideology. A lot of what led to our independence in 1950 was a growing awareness of race and a growing need to assert our particular identity as distinct from the Western identity or the colonial identity. As for decline, well, yes, there are certain things that were done better that were run better before 1950. And afterwards, you see some signs of things going all right. Uh, one of the main indicators, for example, up until the 1960s, Trinidad was an intake of people. There were more people coming in than leaving. In 1960, for the first time in our history, more people left than came in. Mm -hmm. so suddenly, for, for various reasons, we were no longer attractive as a country for people to come to, or at least not as attractive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the, there's a lot of important points you raise there that I want us to dwell on. Um, uh, and, and, and I think this is, this is one of the reasons why Trinidad is so important. Because if we look at our particular history, we'll have a lot of lessons and perhaps implications for other places. Um, 
the colonial narrative, especially now in this time of when people are talking about the legacy of colonialism and racism, you know, there, there's a lot of problematic things which you mention. For instance, you know, I now Selwyn would have grown up during the colonial era, so I, I would very but much I, like I to hear. To contest, I want to contest. Um, um, yeah. Kev- narrative you know I don't I, I, the one thing I want to ask Kevin in terms of that uh, you talk about oppression one of the things of the first whatever years of oppression how do people make themselves do people have no initiative that we are made simply by oppression do people have any other initiative to take in spite of we are autonomous beings yes of course there's the dog but people have been doing all the groups have been self, I don't want to use your term self, self-actualizing, but people mm-hmm. do not, we don't exist because of, in spite of oppression, what people do is they tell and form and do their own stories. They create themselves. That's I point one. I, point I, I think that's what he was saying. I, I, I don't think you're at variance there. Is that right, Kevin? All I right. think we're at variance. I agree. That in yeah, spite yeah. of it, this narrative is one of oppression. oppression. Was that? The narrative is contradicted by the evidence. Yeah. We yeah, don't well, I mean, I wouldn't argue that at all because I think it's people who are always changing and shaping themselves. Exactly. I, I, that, so, 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 so you guys well, are one. Really, the second point, though, I, I, I think is you talk about declining from current state. You know, I'm very fascinated with a guy like Bakunin, Gordon the State, and the mm-hmm. whole question of the role of anarchy. How did, in fact, uh, carry people forward? In fact, you know, Bakunin was very much against Marx. Yeah. Marx sort of evidentially that there would be always progress and so on. And Bakun said, no, 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 not necessarily. That we have to re- re- change and remake the state. So even in the remaking, you know, I think, Kevin, that you're very attracted to statistics. But I don't think statistics tell the whole story. It's really a reflection of things that are happening. And to be sure, if you're going to build a new society, that of course there will be breakdowns and people are gonna to have to try to find themselves on how to do it their own way. So I don't see, I'm not be able to run the trains on time as the English did and all those kinds of things as being necessarily a curse. I see, I think that people must find themselves. I've just read in whatever happened in front of me, capitalism and slavery, and the whole question of John Hawkins and when the, all these guys began, did not begin as a full flung colony. I look at the United States, these colonies had to find themselves and find their ways, even fight among themselves. So I do not necessarily see the problems that we are faced with as being a curse, as it is that we have to find our own ways of doing things in spite of, and probably because of different changes in the world. So I do not see the trains not running on time, uh, et cetera, uh, as being a curse. I see it as people trying to find themselves and walk, organize, your own yeah. destiny. Let, let me explain the title of my book. Huh? The, let me explain the title of my book. The colony yeah. part is, of course, the first half of the century. The first <laughs> is the resource curse. Yeah. Oil derailed our development <clears throat> in many ways. Exactly what you're speaking about, Selwyn. We were going along a particular path. When the oil wealth came, certain things that would <coughs> have developed did not particularly in terms of how we arrange the economy. So, so I agree with you. I, I don't disagree with anything you said, except our approach in terms of statistics and so on, because uh, I know your approach is to look at stories. I look at stories too, but I prefer to look at what these statistics say, what um, contemporary news would have revealed about the society. And when I say the narrative is oppression, that is how we see ourselves as contesting the colonial oppression to have developed ourselves. That's kind of how, the way historians have framed it, sort of, yeah, and so the I'm media. And it, when you look at the actual data, it's not that straightforward. For example, one, one example, you find that even during the colonial period, when you look at index, uh, statistics, you find it's growing every year. And what that means is that the supposedly oppressed people, the black and colored people, and well, back then, mixed is what we say now, were progressing even under colonialism, reaching certain positions. Now, of course, we agree that certain positions were bad to them, but I think given the progress, given the arc that the figures and the um, 
stories show during colonialism, th there would have been a natural progression, um, which didn't necessarily require political independence, or at least not in the form that we took it, for progress to continue. The curse occurs in the 1970s with oil wealth. And that's why I use that phrase, because of the resource curse. I, I, I want to elaborate um, from my own experience, um, from what Kevin was saying, and, I, and I'd like to get your response uh, to it, um, both Kevin and Selwyn. But yeah, um, one is, is that I, I do think that the, the narrative of Trinidadians fighting the British uh, is exaggerated and imported from other nationalist struggles. I, I, I don't, we, we did not have that type of fight like Haiti or like India even, for example. Uh, and, and in fact, at independence, there were many people who did not want independence and the British but the British were inexorable after Ghana had left in 1957 and the winds of change in Africa. They, they were looking to sort of get rid of their colonies. And in fact, many people. So the people's struggle had nothing to do with it. They just want to give it away. Right? Well, yeah, no, no, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm saying in Trinidad, the people's struggle around the world. Yes. The two things. But, I think we've got to be very careful. And, 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 yeah. So I. I so I, I just want to, okay, we, okay let, let's, let's continue with that. So yeah, so respond. No, I'm saying, I think that, uh, again, Kelvin's notion again is the, the progress of the black and brown people and the economy. Uh, Kevin knows more better than I do that under colonialism, there were these, uh, they, they, they were, these were the countries that produce for the mother country. And they had one product, I mean, we know that very well, be it sugar or sisal or cocoa and that there were different markets abroad because it was being sent there. It was an outward oriented economy. And of course, we'd produce certain things. Now, if that narrative is being changed, if in other words, because of independence, and I do not accept the fact that our struggle at home and taking over the base and walking in the streets meant nothing, it may have been accelerated. It's almost like Black Lives Matter. Things are going on and certain things happen, certain incidents that speed things up. So we could begin to argue in 60s, you had a whole range going back to uh, Bandang and the whole bit and Kenya and Ghana and Zikawe and, 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 and so that certain things happened which sped it up. Now, once you didn't have those protected markets, the same thing happened by the way in 1846 when they had to put, put come the sugar, the sugar acts, you know, when for mm -hmm. example, we had, had to be, begin to compete free sugar, I had to compete with slave sugar from Cuba and et cetera, et cetera. These things happen in history. So then you had after say the sixties, what you have is that you don't have these protected markets anymore. You gotta go out there and fight for yourself. And so therefore the nature of social relations vis-a-vis -vis the, the mother countries and those economy change. You don't have a ready set market. Now I agree with you. I think that we, we, we have called oil the black curse. I mean, a lot of people, oil, what it, did, I think it broke up social relations. Like for example, if I, when my mother had to babysit and she'd go down the road and say, uh, neighbor, throw eye on the children for me, so and so on. But once again, when money is no problem, then of course everything becomes commoditized and monetized. And you have a different kind. Not that I just tell stories, I, go, I look at the statistics too, but I don't place that emphasis. I think statistics is simply a sort of reflection of what's going on. But I think within it, uh, uh, statistics, statistics don't make history. It is people who make history. And what the statistics do, it records them. So I what, what, what I want to, two points I want to make about the, this idea about the, the fight for, for independence. Right, which I, I do believe is exaggerated, right? Oh, Certainly the, 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 the PNM <laughs> stood for that because there was a large part of the population that were fearful of independence. Yes, I know. That's why right. capitalists exactly. they went up to England and said, "Don't give us independence." That's right. So what's right. the problem? You know, I, 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 and be, 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 any because, any any minority group, yeah, in terms of independence, have to watch out for their own, be sure that their own rights are enshrined. Yeah, which was simply done. So not wanting it does not make it a virtue. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I, I I'm not talking about it being virtuous or not. I, I'm just I'm just talking about the 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 idea I love of, I want the Caribbean Court of Justice, by the way. Yes, yes, exactly. And I, 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 for example, mm -hmm. I, I do prefer the Privy Council 
to the Caribbean Court of Justice mm -hmm. at, at the right. Um, and and but um, and and you know there are a lot of people today who would still say that you know Britain should take us over us back. We should we should never become independent. We you know we should have remained a colony. I'm not saying that I I'm not agreeing with with that, but I understand why people say it though. And there are people who would say, listen, if you compare us to Turks and Caicos or to Cayman Islands or or to some of the islands that did remain colonies, they do better. I know Jamaicans have argued that quite a bit. Certain Jamaicans because Cayman Islands is right next to them, used to be a part of them, and since independence, they look at what happened to Cape. Turks and Caicos and, and so forth. But, but there is this, I, I've always felt that the, the test of, in, of independence was to see whether those former colon, no, those, those still colonies, Martinique, Guadeloupe, would say, wow, I wish we became independent too. And you know what? When I visit there, I don't get that sense. They, were, they had representation in the French parliament. That's right. They were, not, they, were, they were part of the French society in ways that we were not. So British mm. colonialism is different from French colonialism. Yeah. And Although Turks and Caicos and Cayman. I mean, I, would, I, I, don't, I don't know those are apt analogies. I think yeah. what we have to say is that, um, what I would say, I mean, in all respect to people who want to go back to Britain and Spain and so on, is yeah. that part of just growing up, it means that you have to stand on your own and mm -hmm. work through your own stories. Yeah. I don't know we'd be better off if we were in England and all that stuff. I know, I know what England's doing itself because I remember going to England in the 60s and see how the monies begin to decline and the economy, once it began to get stopped, couldn't get those resources from those colonies. I do think we still have a great story to tell. Yeah, I think we could, if we could win in those parties, I think, for example, the greatest thing right now, the most important thing, which I think we really feel, and I don't say we're going there, Kevin, in terms of the blacks and the brown people and what happened, is the plight of black people. I don't think that in terms of the economy, whether we have in fact achieved what we should be achieving, I don't think it has to do any other force. It has to do how the economy is run and who has in the interest and who, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it seems to me that uh, we've done a pretty, I mean, I, I think the question of we've done a pretty good job and we'll find, we'll, I mean, this, I guess, probably hope and so on. I think we'll work our problems through. And I think being on our own, I mean, of course, it's difficult for any small colony of 1.3 million people to begin to compete, you know, with others and so on. But within that frame, I think that, uh, you know, we could, we shouldn't keep on trying to, if we could only get rid of the crime and get rid of the fact that sitting groups control the economy and so on. I think we could we could work things out. Kevin, you have anything you want to add? Yeah, he has a lot of ideas. Smiling. Quite, quite <laughs> a few things. <laughs> um, first, the question is not unanswerable. As you, as you pointed out, Kirk, there are those uh, Caribbean uh, territories which re which kept a connection to their various uh, colonizers. Okay, and when you look at the Again, going back to statistics, you look at the key indicators, things like infant mortality, crime rates, and so on, particularly homicide rate, you find that those which remain that kept a connection of some sort, a political connection or governmental connection, are better off by key measures than those Caribbean territories which took or opted for full independence. So that's one point. Moreover, the particular question of identity, you find that, as you say, with um, these places, they don't, the people there don't seem to be less authentic than the people in the independent Caribbean territories. So that's one. The other question as can, to Can I just add, add an illustration to that, Kevin? Sure. But, uh, just, I remember in Martinique, I was at a hotel and the sugar packets had Edward Glisson, Aimé Césaire, um, you know, and Leopold saying, I, I said, this would never happen in Trinidad. You know? <laughs> but anyway, go on. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that has to do um, with the connection to a larger country where you can publish, where you can have intellectual work, which is why, or one of the reasons why we had more uh, vibrant or golden age then of fiction writing of novels and so on 
back in the uh, 50s and 60s. And we don't have that now because we don't have that network to that extent. That's one thing. Now coming to the, uh, as Selvin said, you have to stand on your own feet. Now that is true of the individual. Is it true of a society, of a country, of a nation? It's an ideological statement, but what you really want, what is your ultimate aim? You want the people of that country, of that territory to have, um, let's call it broadly, a good life. You want certain things. You want uh, peace, you want prosperity. Peace as uh, measured by homicide rate, obviously we have failed in that, okay? Uh, Trinidad has always had a high homicide rate. It was a bit lower during colonial times, but not much. And then in 2003, it accelerated. It went from seven per 100,000 murders per year to 30 per 100,000, and it has stayed there. Why? Again, it has to do with oil, the curse of oil. It has to do with funding the URP and various other factors that came in there. Now, within all that, Obviously, we can't go back to being a colony of Britain. That's, that, that's a no-brainer. But the ideology that has led to us rejecting Western civilization, this whole trope of white supremacy, of um, systemic racism, and so on, when you start to reject the tenets, the, the positive tenets of Western civilization, which formed us, then you get those consequences which undermine the society. So, you know, we have these different groups um, working at odds. And I mean, Selvin said something interesting there about who is in charge of the economy. Well, again, you look at 1901 and at the turn of the century, the first oil well, you have Randolph Rust and um, a Chinese person um, I have his name here, Lamwai, Lam, Lam like anyway, I'll get it just now. But the point is that within the colonial framework, the Chinese came here and were able to establish themselves pretty early. So they're, they're, within Western civilization, there are tenets that allow for the progress of all groups. And when you come to talk about who should be in charge, again, don't people have agency? How come certain groups came to be in charge? Was it because they were favored or was it because they had certain uh, values, certain skills that enabled them to progress? And the flip side of that, other individuals and groups were not able to progress because of certain factors inherent to them, as well as the one, the colonial system at first, and then later on, the particular economic and political policies that were put in place after colonialism. All right, so let, let, let me, you know, th this is, although it's a global audience with Trinidadians talking here, and you know, Trinidadians are very open about race, right, in, in a way that people maybe are not. We always talk about, so now, it sounds like it, you're, you're saying a oh, racial Edward, argument. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, it, so it, it, it sounds like you're, you're making a racial argument about um, Africans, Indians, Chinese, whites, and pro economic yeah. propensity and so forth. Um, yeah. That that's certainly what what you're you're hinting at. But you want to elaborate on it, um, and then we'll have Selma. Oh. What, yeah, what I'm, what I'm rejecting is the, the, the idea that we have to stand on our own feet to grow up, okay? I don't know that you can apply that in such a, 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 a simple way to a, a society. Um, I think that had we taken, let's say, a middle path of like some of the other territories and retained a connection to Britain, and had the oil not come along, that in many ways we would have been better off today. Those are counterfactual because of that of how history unfolded. And I say that because the evidence shows, when you compare us with the other Caribbean territories, that shows that that's the likely outcome. 
All right, Ke uh, Selwyn. I don't, I, 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 Kevin, I find, a, how do we reject Western? I have not rejected Western civilization. I reject those. You haven't, but there is an ideology that does that. I, I don't know. I, I'm uncontesting your interpretation of the phenomenon. I sure. don't think people reject Western, uh, Western civilization. They reject certain values of Westerns, such as racism, which we think is inimical to the growth of men and people. Nobody is like anything else. You see, you look for the bad, you look for the good, you keep the good and let the bad. I don't know how you could ever prove that we rejected Western civilization. Okay, let, let, let me phrase it to you differently. I'd really like to hear your opinion on this, Selwyn, on the same issue. You know, in the 1950s, um, in the 1950s, the leading doctors, lawyers, intellectuals, and so forth were Afro Trinidadians. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and there was a certain ideology, I believe, among, you know, the, like the Afro Saxon. You wanted to out British the British. And, and they did, right? I mean, African uh, men in particular. It had, um, to, do, it had uh, to do with the opportunities. In point of fact, that whole group were trained in certain kinds, be it CIC and St. Mary's and all of those places. And they, that's why Britain, British put up the, the schools like Queen's College in, in, in Guyana and so on, and brought in their own dons. You go back to James yeah. and Bennett Boundary and so on. And but, they, but, but by 1970, mm -hmm. okay, when we became independent, um, mm -hmm. you know, and by 1970, a different ideology came in place saying e education it's is white and good. not, you know, I, I know it was a rejection, don't I you think? I don't think that you're using these terms. You, you, you just, not a different yeah. ideology comes in. People are, I think people are struggling to try to understand phenomena. Of course. As you look back and Kevin keeps saying that if we didn't do so and if, which are our counterfactuals, we, never, we necessarily cannot know. That's what we did. All right. In fact, because of what we were faced with, you guys now go back and hold that. And if the oil didn't come, I even take out the ground. I mean, that is not an argument. I don't think. So. I don't believe Kevin that. In point of fact, I think that the. I mean, James was big about that. There are many progressive values in Western civilizations in terms of technology and so on, but they're also very negative. Primarily, the racial ideology. It's negative. And yes, people reject that. We should continue to reject that. As we see it's happening right now in Black Lives Matter, that people should reject those things that are negative, that, that are antithetical to your own development as a human being. We accept okay, I, I'm going to have to interrupt here because we're, we've reached the one, one hour right? mark. <laughs> and, 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 uh, but, you know, I, one thing I wanted, uh, although we, we may have gotten, uh, you know, on very specific issues, and, and, and I hope we didn't lose our international audience here, or even our national one, but, um, but I, I do want to emphasize too that this type of dis discourse that exists in Trinidad, it, it, it's amazing. We do have an amazing intellectual discourse here in Trinidad. Oh, not it's such sport. a small That's island. Amazing. I mean, I, I no, lived abroad. I don't know if you know this book. I, I know you've got to end. Yeah. I'm reading a book by a guy with his name Lockhart, written in 1892 on Pan-Africanism. Mm -hmm. I don't know yeah. if you know that work. I the don't guy, know that one. The Lone Star of Nigeria. Okay. The brother from, the brother from uh, um, not down by Sawo down there, that side, not Kor, what's the, 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 the uh, Arong Sawo. And this mm -hmm. guy is writing the most fantastic and fascinating thing on um, Pan Africanism, yeah. taking on these. Re I mean, we have this fun, uh, go back to James, go back to this guy, JJ Thomas, but we are taking on the world. Now, I think, Kevin, you will point to that as a matter of all arches and so on. But I, 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 it would be really nice to continue this discussion because I think it really brings up a whole lot of very important questions. And the one yeah. thing I love about it, let's disagree because we may have, but I think we all learn. I mean, I learn a lot from Kevin uh, and read him very carefully, but I, I think there are other ways of trying to look at the phenomenon. They really, really are. So yeah, yeah. That, it might be nice to continue the discussion at some point. Yeah, I think so. Well, uh, in, in closing though, um, all right. Let, let, let me ask you very, very quickly uh, a couple things. Uh, what would you like to see? What would you like to see realistically happen to Trinidad in, let's say, the next 10, 20 years? We have an election coming up next week. Uh -huh. do, you, do you think that, that there's, 
what 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 do you think is is achievable in the next 20 years uh, I, I, I said for, my... I'll start with let's start with Kevin first and and okay. then also what is your fear what's your greatest fear for the future of Trinidad and Tobago okay um we're in an economic recession which may lead to collapse I think in the long run that may be a good thing because it may force us to come out of the curse policies the oil curse policies and actually put some real economic policies in place and I think what you say given our native talent our native intelligence we can become quite prosperous quite diverse we can achieve all we are supposed to achieve my greatest fear is that the uh, people in, in power may decide not to do that they may decide to go for the authoritarian option which of course will bring us to Venezuela in a very short order all right and Selwyn what realistically in the next 10 20 I know, years I know, I'm just like to keep realistic I, mean, I can be realistic I think I'm being realistic I don't think I've been unrealistic no I think one reason why I supported Kamala and the UNC is I think that the the two major the three major four major challenges I see uh, Kevin I'm giving the stories right the first one is some way in which we could try to uh, make Afro Afro Trinbagonians in terms of see to bring them up, lift up the standards, give them more resources, and they have more resources. That's the first one. I think the second one is I think the question of making uh, uh, that's why I think the Kamla regime may be important is bringing making Indians feel more a part of the whole, even though they're the largest group. I think it's been a sense of not being a part of the whole, which has been quite a problem. And I think her historic mission should be to talk about a much more united and cohesive society that begin to speak to the needs of all. So I don't see this all doom and gloom. I think if we, and that's the reason, if we take another direction and speak to people's development, not the development of a few top class people keep on getting the money and so on. And I think she has a challenge. So I think if you have a new government who understand the challenge in terms of social cohesion, racial cohesion, lifting up different groups and so on, and talking about the event from the bottom up, it could change the trajectory of which uh, Kevin is speaking. Okay, excellent. And I know both of you have books out right now. I want you to just um, plug your books and, and let us know if you're also working on anything right now. Kevin, uh, yeah. tell us about- so The book uh, um, I've written is called uh, From Colony to Curse. Uh, a Social and Economic History of Trinidad, 1901 to 2001. It is the only modern history of Trinidad, modern general history. Uh, before that, we, we Bridget Barrington's book, History of Trinidad, which goes up to 1967. So I hope it builds a gap that has been existing for a long time. Okay, great. And that's available um, on yeah, Amazon uh, internationally and local Amazon books. Here. Book. Yeah, I haven't done print copies yet, but they should be out shortly. Okay, great. And Selwyn? Um, I just finished a book called uh, The Slave Master Trinidad, in which I tried to chronicle the fact that the only slave, well, not the only, I think it's the only book done about the slave, but, but the slave master in Trinidad. I know we have another book. And of course, going back to James and going back even to Du Bois, that at the, so you can't talk about slavery without talking to the slave master. I mean, that was, that's the whole point of Black Reconstruction, the whole point of James's Black Jacobins and the whole, and in fact, we have not looked at that. So I think if it allows us to understand the role of the slave master as being an integral part and in trying to understand our history is very important. Next book I'm doing, I'm doing a book of uh, two guys, uh, which is almost finished, but I can't do anything because of COVID. And one has to do with this guy, Douglin, who was a slave, mm -hmm. who was trained at Codrington, who was then sent to Rio Pedras and Sierra Leone, to begin to evangelize slaves, then eventually came to Trinidad and became the pastor of, um, of um, the pastor that place, not St. Stephen, St. Clements, and became mm -hmm. a very advocate when Williams and Sylvester Williams came down, he was very much active in their group. So I want to tell his story. And then another guy called um, Joshua Stanley. Uh, he had, this is a, a native sort of, pa a, a local pastor, lay reader, and he would write his sermons out. And one day I was able to talk to my son just very casually saying, I remember my dad, you know, writing all his sermons in a copy book. I said, you have that? He said, let me look and see. And we got those, those books as a masterpiece from 19, about 1908, right up to 62. And I've edited those books, again, to show the native sort of people yeah. who come to terms and so on. And, these, and he's from the same Aruka area. 
So that's what I'm working on. I just need to get a little bit. There's some things I got to do in the San Fernando Gazette to pick, fill in that gap from say about nine, from 1890 to about 90. He died in 1902 to get there. But that's that's what I'm working on. It's almost finished. It's really finished. But after you finish a book, Kevin, as you know, you get so exhausted. You don't want to see it or hear about it. So after that finish my true. sleep, that's oh my god. But grad and of course the COVID has been very bad on me in the sense that it's just demotivated de me, and so on. So I'm getting, but I'm getting back on track. Oh, that that's excellent. I mean, I I I am just so uh, delighted to hear about all this work being done about and from Trinidad. You know, uh, it, there's just really so but much it, for it, the world it, to it, learn. The book on um, on this guy Dublin goes from Barbados mm -hmm. to London to Rio Pedras yeah. back to England and then to Trinidad. Really triangular and very important in terms of and you go back to people, you know, like, you know, all the larger thing. He was a part of that whole Pan-Africanist group in Africa. No? And the whole question of linguistics was very important. He did the, the major language, something called Soso, and he did the New Testament and Soso. Quite an, an enterprising person. Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, like Lloyd Best too, <laughs> his father. But it, uh, thanks so much for this enlightening and entertaining discussion. It's it's really been a pleasure having you both on the program, Selwyn and Kevin. Thanks well, for having us. Thank us for having us. I think it's a nice, these kinds of discussions are so very necessary. Yeah, yeah. so very necessary for us too. Well, that's it for this week's episode of a Story Club Global Cultures. We were talking with our guest, Professor Selwyn Kajo and writer Kevin Baldio Singh on the topic 100 years of Trinidad and Tobago. Please join us again next week. And in the meanwhile, like, share, and tell your friends about us. Thanks again, and see you next week. All right, guys. Thanks so much. Bye now. All right. Bye. Bye.